against you, where I have not asked for your help, where I have not accepted this gift of salvation that you freely give, and I receive you into my life. I receive you, and I come in agreement with your will for my life. And I say, Lord, here I am. Let your will be done. Let your purpose be accomplished. And I choose to follow you this day. I choose to surrender all to you. And from this day, as you agree with the prayer and as you pray to yourself, know that your life will not be the same, but you have to engage and continue in that relationship and that fellowship with him. Continue to read his word. Continue to acknowledge him in everything you do. Amen. Thank you. Let's realize we are live. Pastor Margaret, thank you. I'm here. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I really wanted to let this flow onto the live stream because I felt like the Lord was ministering and I wanted the brethren to, to connect with what is happening, to connect with the flow that the Lord is uh, releasing through his, his children tonight. Praise God. And so we don't want to always have a sort of pre-plan how things will be. We know what time we're supposed to be on. But once the Holy Spirit began to move and he's ministering, we want to always ensure that he has that, that freedom. There's no restraint to say what he wants to say through whomever he wants to speak. And so we thank you for what was shared. Uh, Prophetess Michelle Baldwin and, and my wife for what you've just shared. And so that's what we always want to do. When the Holy Spirit begins to move and move our hearts to do certain things, we let him do it. See, we don't ever want to restrain his movement in any way. Praise God. Good evening again to all those of you joining us this evening. And it's a pleasure to be with you this evening, to be in your company again today. It's a precious day that the Lord has made. And we want to continue to yield and remain yielded to him as he takes us from glory to glory and from strength to strength. What an honor we have uh, to be his children and to be vessels through whom he expressed himself in the ways he chooses to. And we want to always, and I just want to reemphasize this, we want to always remain pliable in the hand of the Lord, always pliable in his hands that he can do whatever he wants to do through us at any time, in any place. And we make no excuse for allowing ourselves to be the vessels of a vessel of vessels through whom he would say whatever he chooses, chooses to say. This is his temple. We are his temple. And he must be allowed to say what he chooses to say or to express himself in whatever way he chooses to through his temple. And that's who we are. We are his house, his dwelling place. Praise God. And Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the sound that has been released through your children this evening and for those who have been ministered unto as you issue the call, the continual call to be drawn to you, to surrender all, to give up everything that is not of you, and to cling to you. Thank you for those who have responded those who are responding and maintaining their positions of continual response to you. We bless your name and we thank you, Lord. Precious Father, ruler of the nations, we are here. We are gathered together again. Let your will be accomplished. Let the purpose of your heart be made known. We are your children. Thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding. Thank you, Lord God. We bless your name. Thank you for the power of choice you've given to us. And thank you for those who have made it their choice to do exactly what you required. Thank you for your grace and the power of your mighty spirit. Be glorified in the midst of your children. To the glory of your name, Father, we thank you. 
in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. I was made to understand that those of you having a little difficulties with your, your connections, it happens sometimes. We have had that back and forth, but uh, we are glad whenever it is it's stabilized. Uh, these are things, these things happen sometimes. And so we, we are thankful um, for the opportunity again to be with you this evening. God is good. God is good. So welcome those of you joining us on by the live stream and all of our brothering here. I can feel the urgency of the Lord really stirring. And, and again, he continued to, to speak to us and he continued to call. His voice is very strong in the earth. But I, by that, I mean in the body of Christ, his voice is very strong. And blessed are those of us who are fine-tuned with frequency, hearing exactly what he has said and what he continues to say. And to those of you from last week or from Tuesday who would have made your decision to remain faithful to Christ, you have done what he asked. You have you made a decision. It, it caused you some uh, discomfort in the process, but that is good. Once you made the choice to do what he said, you are in the right place. And you now must maintain that position. Though the enemy will try to challenge it ever so often in many different ways, don't shift from that, from that position. Remain faithful to God. And his strength has been given to you. You have the strength you need. And remember, there are many others, countless, who made the decision you have made. A choice to do what God said. It cost them up to a certain point. But it ushered them into the freedom and the liberty of God through which they were able to fulfill their destiny in the earth. And now with the Father, they're rejoicing and thankful that they made the decision that they made when they made it. So again, you have a great company of those who have done the same, both here on earth still and those who have gone on to be with the Lord. So maintain your position. Don't be shaken. Don't be shaken. You were not alone. You're not the first person and you will not be the last. Maintain your position, okay? Blessings to you. Welcome to the great company of those who stood for the Lord and made the choice to do what he asked. Amen? And when you do that, what you have really shown is that you're willing to serve the Lord and you're willing to serve him at all cost. And you've said, in essence, you really love the Lord. That's the proof of your love your willingness to obey and remain consistent in our obedience. Praise God. Uh, there is something that I felt the Lord, the Lord wants me to share with you tonight. And it had to do with um, us understanding the sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of the Lord. Uh, many of us aren't aware of that fact that God is sovereign. And that his sovereignty at times would cause us or bring us to the place of feeling a sense of bewildered because we don't understand why he would have done the things that he did or why he made certain decisions. And oftentimes we would try to, in our own minds, try to understand why would he make this decision? Why would he do this and why would he do that? It is not for us to allow ourselves to become bewildered, trying to figure out why God did what he did and the way he did what he did. What we're responsible for is to obey what he said. And even though we may not fully understand the reasons why he would make certain decisions, you must trust this fact that God is always right. God cannot make mistakes. 
he never make a mistake. His knowledge transcends the present time and anticipates all events throughout time because he's God. We don't have that ability. God has that ability. So whenever he makes certain decisions, um, know that our best interest is at heart and his glory is the focus of that. See, his glory is the focal point and our inches, our best inches is taken into consideration with all the decision that the creator of the universe will make. So having turned from what he asked you to turn from, having responded to the Lord, which you did, wonderful. Again, maintain that position. Now he wants you to know something about him. And so what I'm going to share with you tonight and the scripture references I will give to you, it is designed to convey one thing, one main subject, one main thing he wants you to know. And that is that the Lord who has called you out to himself is sovereign. And he wants you to know that. The Lord our God tells us that he is the sovereign God. Meaning, he is unrestricted, unrestricted, unlimited, and boundless. Unrestricted, unlimited, and boundless. The sovereign God. Keep that in your mind. Unrestricted, unlimited, and he's boundless. He wants us to know that. All of his virtues are subjected to his unrestricted, unlimited, and boundless acts. All of his virtues. There's a reason why he wants you to know that, just as others would have experienced God to be this. And you and I, we would experience this. And so he doesn't want you to be surprised to find out that God is sovereign and can act sovereignly in any part of the universe because everything belongs to him. He made it, he owns it, it is all his, okay? So he wants you to know that he's sovereign and that all of his virtues are subjected to his sovereignty, his boundless acts, unrestricted acts throughout the universe. He wants us to know that. He calls us now, he calls us out of our own confined space. See, because now we, are, we have left. Our own confined space has to do with our own mentality, our own thinking, our own way of, way of speaking and acting. The calling out removes us from those boundaries that confines us. So we are confined by our own mentality. We are confined by our own way of thinking. We are confined by our own way of speaking and acting. Okay? When he calls us out from where we have been to himself, he wants us to know what we've entered into. Of course, you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're already in Christ. But the severing of the things that confined us to be released into what he calls us to in himself, he is, he's likening it onto our space, our confinement in all the different ways. So all the, all the things that we, we allow to be attached to us, which confined us and kept us away from being all that he wants us to be, all that he has designed us to be, He's saying to us now, now that I call you out, you, you've responded. He's now ushered, he's, he has now ushered us into his sovereign environment. What is his sovereignty? Boundless, limitless, unrestricted. So you have entered into an environment in God of boundlessness. So he wants you to know that. 
And so over the process of time, you're going to begin to understand some things about God that you did not know before. Okay? So, we've been ushered into his sovereign environment in which we will discover that his wisdom and knowledge is beyond human comprehension. And we will agree with the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36. We would agree with what the Apostle Paul discovered. And you would find that everyone uh, who have walked with God discovered some things about God that amaze them. And of course, all of us as children would have some of these amazing moments as well as we discover the boundless acts of God. And he's going to blow a fuse. Think he should move on what decision we think he should make as opposed to the decision he will make and has made throughout the scriptures. And so the Apostle Paul understood this about God. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33 to 36 from the New Living Translation. And it says, Oh, how great are God's riches. This is the Apostle Paul. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. And he said, how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his way. Or his way or the way in which he does things. His decision, how impossible it is for us to understand why he decided to do things the way he does. The apostle, Paul goes on, the apostle goes on to say, for who can know the Lord's thoughts, meaning apart from God's own initiative, if he does not initiate those thoughts to us, if he does not reveal them to us, who can know God's thoughts? We cannot know God's thoughts by ourselves, in ourselves. We only know his thoughts because he tells us. He makes it known to us. So the apostle is expressing an understanding that he has gained uh, due to his walk and his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. For who know the Lord's thoughts? And then he goes on to say, who who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? Who has done that? Who has given God so much that God owes him or her and has to pay him or her back? Everything belongs to God. And so the conclusion is, for everything comes from him. From God, everything comes from him. Everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever and ever. So everything belongs to him. So the more we understand the sovereignty of God and what he does with what he has and the decision that he make, he doesn't want us to become bewildered about the decisions that he would make or try to figure it out. All he wants from us is our consistent obedience to him. And the moment we sit down and try to reason why would he do this, why he didn't do it this way, uh, we are saying, we, we, we would be seen in essence, imperfection, that's who we are, as opposed to the perfect God, is trying to tell God how he should do what he has done. No, we are learning from him. He is not imitating us. We are imitators of God as their children, not the other way around. So we are learning. Perfection is God, and everything he does is perfect. Even though we do not understand his decisions, he is perfect. Okay, And so again, as Paul understood these things about God, no one can advise him. No one has advised him. 
He don't need our, our advice. No one tells him or can tell him how he should run his business. He run his business the way he wants to. And in as much as all of us are the greatest of us, we still cannot advise God. <laughs> as much as we've come to know, it is like picking up two grains of sand from all the oceans of sand, the seashores of sand in the world, in terms of God's knowledge and his wisdom. And so please understand, and, and you will hear this throughout the night, the call is to trust him even when you don't understand the decision that he makes. He is always right. Keep that in your mind. He's always right. So Paul understood that. This is what the Apostle Paul understood as, as the sovereignty of God was made known to him. He was not alone in this. Others shared the same sentiment and left for us record or records of their discovery of this awesome operation of God, the greatness of God, the power of this God that we're serving, the power and ability of the one who calls us. And the reason why he's emphasizing this, again, I want to say, he does not want us to become bewildered and trying to think uh, he should have done it this way. I, I don't understand why he did it this way. Why did he do it? No. Uh, isn't it amazing, before I go any further, isn't it amazing, every time I think of this, this passage of scripture in particular, and many others, but isn't it amazing when you think of the fact that here is a people, talking about the children of Israel, journeying through the wilderness, uh, rebelled against God in the fashion and the way that they did. God judged them by sending a flying serpent, bit many of them and they died couldn't find a way out to be healed. There was not, not, nothing they could have done. Went to Moses. Moses prayed for, he, for, for them. Uh, you will say, but why didn't God just, why didn't just God tell him to stretch his hand towards them and heal them? Uh, why, didn't this, why didn't God, because he has the power, why he didn't just heal them by one prayer of Moses? Why Moses had to go through the whole process of, getting bronze, building or making a snake, erecting a pole, putting the snake that he made from bronze on the pole, because God told him to do that. The people having just left Egypt, God warned them about idol worshipers. Don't bow down to idols. Don't serve them. I, the Lord alone, I'm God. They heard that. They heard the voice of God declaring that. Moses also mentioned it to them. This is what God said. Now, this is the problem. One would say, but God, you're all powerful. Why he has to go through the whole process of killing, uh, uh, making this bronze serpent that was biting and killing the people, put it on a pole, and then tell the people to look to it. Everybody who's bitten, look on the pole and to the snake on the pole. Now, in our time, we would have a great issue with that because you can pull up the scripture and say, look, God said it here. Look, look, it is written in black and white or red and white or whatever the color of print. You would argue tooth and nail, as we say in our twang or local twang, you would argue with that because Look, God, God cannot look, look at it. It's written here. Look at it written here. I underline this. I, I circle it out. It's written. But then God is sovereign. The same God said, don't bow down to this. The same God said, go and make one, a serpent, from on, and put it on a pole. And when the people get bitten, let them look to it. Moses, ah, you've missed God. You've missed God. You've missed God. So relationship is what helps us to understand. Just to do what God said. Moses knew what God told him prior to that. He didn't argue with God. He just do what God said. But the result was there. It wasn't a snake healing the people. God had something further in mind. He was demonstrating something that Moses knew nothing about. 
until Jesus used it when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. What was the principle? The principle was they could not live. All those who were bitten by the serpent could not live apart from looking to the serpent. And to look to the serpent, they had to choose. So Jesus drew the principle from there, the principle from there to show who he was and still is. That in order for you to live spiritually, in order for you to have life, you have to look to me. Moses did not know because God didn't tell him, Moses, I'm doing this because Jesus is coming and he's going to be using this as an example. So this is the reason why I'm doing this. Moses don't know the reason apart from God said, make it and put it there. So one of the things that hinders us from progressing in God is because it seems to us at times that God is contradicting himself. No, he's not. He would never do that. His heart, wisdom, and nature would not permit him to do that. We become confused when we don't understand what he's doing. And so if he doesn't explain it to us the way we think he should explain it to us before we act, then we are, because God has to explain it to me. All he calls you need to do is to follow him. What would have happened had Moses not make this, the serpent and put it on a pole? What would have happened? And then Jesus would not have had that illustration to use. God is wise. So he looks into our present time, but he looks into a realm beyond our present time and all of our journeys in life. He has seen all of that. He is amazing. And you have to, you have to be flexible with God and your relationship with him is what's going to help you. And the weakness of the Holy Spirit on the inside is going to help you as you journey with God so that you don't become confused in his methods of administration because it's not going to be what you think it would be or how you assume it would be. It will be the way God purposed it to be. And so he wants you to understand that about him. So um, understood that this is who God is. In Psalms chapter 145 and verse 3, Psalms 145 and verse 3, the psalmist said, great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Nobody can. His greatness cannot be measured from the New Living Translation. That's Psalms 1, 45 and verse 3. No one can measure his greatness, his ability in all the things that he has done and continues to manifest. No one can measure. You cannot measure. Why you can't measure? Because his greatness is immeasurable. It is too extensive. Too extensive to be measured. And this underscores what is written in Job chapter 11, verse 7 to 9. And these are persons who understand this whole, this um, mysterious works of God. And so he wants you to know this because having called you to himself, remove you and I from our humanistic way of thinking, which confines us to our own views or views of others. Now we are ushered into an understanding of the eternal God who acts sovereignly. And he wants us to understand having removed us from all of our confinement and we are ushered into an understanding of God that time on earth would not permit us to know the fullness of. But we would learn a lot to understand the greatness of the sovereignty of God. So in Job chapter 11, verse 7 to 9, it says, can you solve the mysteries of God? That's from the New Living Translation. Can you, serve, can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you solve the mysteries of God? His person, why he does the things that he does on your own without his initiative? Can you? Can you serve the mystery of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? 
I want to ask yourself this question. Can any one of us on our own discover everything about the Almighty? Having asked those two questions, it goes on to say, such knowledge, what knowledge? What knowledge? The mysteries of God, discovering everything about the Almighty. Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. Now, during that time, and God breathed those understanding to, um, to Job, they didn't have the technology that we have today, where plane can and, and rockets can reach certain touch on different planets. Just think of the natural human person trying to reach up, looking at the vastness of God in comparison to us, our ability to ascend beyond earth in ourselves by ourselves. Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. Who are you? It is deeper than the underworld. And what are you? <laughs> Can you reach this? Can you go beyond the depth of the underworld? Can you go beyond the heavens? It is broader than the earth, the mysteries, the wisdom and knowledge of God, broader than the earth. It is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. His way of doing things transcend all human limitations. That's what, he's trying, that's what he's trying to convey. God's way of doing things transcend all human limitations. All the investigations of men, or all the investigations of man, in his own attempt to search out the deep things of God, have proven to be futile, incapable of any useful result. We will only know what God wants us to know. And this is what you must also discover. He wants you to know in this environment of the sovereignty of God. Only what he wants you to know, you would know. Nothing else. And I remember having to, to share with people many times things that I wish I could have said to them. I wish I could have said otherwise, apart from what the Lord told me. And of course, you get into trouble with this because you don't know any, anything other than what the Lord told you. And so they wanted about the why. I don't know the why. Well, seek him to find out why. Well, even if I ask him why and he chooses not to tell me, I cannot tell you the why because God didn't tell me why. All he said is dust and dust and dust. And so when dust and dust and dust happen, of course, I see that it happened. But why? I don't know. But you're a man of God. You should not know. No. Being a man of God does not mean a woman of God. That means that you would know everything, all the reason why God does what he does. No. Only what he tells us we know. If we assume to say anything other than what he said, we are moving an assumption that leads to error. So the sovereignty of God, only do what he says. We don't have to always understand it or why he tells us to do what he tells us to do. All he requires of us is our cooperation, even when naturally it doesn't seem to make sense. Could you imagine God telling Moses to lead the children of Israel in a certain place, certain direction? And God knew that they would get to a point where there would be no way to go but see. He knew that all along. And he knew that Pharaoh was going to pursue them, but he led them there. 
why didn't he lead them somewhere else? We can ask those questions. Why did he choose to cause, as we would say, such trauma to the people by knowing that Pharaoh and his men were pursuing them and the whole trauma that they experienced. So the psychologist would say, uh, no, this was too much trauma. Uh, God should have known better to lead him a certain way so as to avoid the trauma of the people. So their mind would be more peace and not have the experience with all the children. Think of the little children who were there and they saw their parents going through that, the trauma that was on the children as well. And so they need to be healed from the trauma. We would think all of that, human rationalizing God's methods. God knew going this path and Moses obeyed. Got to a point now they will see and look behind Pharaoh and his men coming and they wouldn't come in to give, to give them gifts and, and welcome them with nice gifts back to Egypt. They were coming with destruction in their mind. And the people felt the rage that was coming from the Egyptians as they were being pursued by them. But God led them there. We can act, rationalize, but God, you know, why? Let's come, let us reason why. No, unless he tells you why. The fact is, go that way. Then when he got to that point, and the, the, the Egyptians were pursuing, God told them, go in the sea, keep walking. <laughs> walking where God knows to go, the sea. Speak to the people, let them go forward. God, go forward where? Where do we go forward? God, you, you don't realize this sea, water is sea. Are you saying to the people, throw themselves in the sea and start swimming? Are those who, who can't swim, suddenly the anointing will come upon them and they're going to sail through the water like boats and, and, and Pharaoh men cannot ride their horse in water? How are you going to do this? God didn't tell Moses prior to him, uh, instructing Moses to lead the children out of, out of Egypt to bring them to the land that he told them to, that they were going in. He didn't tell Moses that he would, they would get to a place where there would be a sea, Red Sea, Pharaoh going to pursue them. God told him that Pharaoh was going to let the people go at a certain point and you bring them out. But he didn't tell him that when he got to a certain point, Pharaoh was going to come after you, but I'm going to part the, the sea and this was going to happen. No, he would find that out along the way. He had no knowledge of that prior to obeying the instructions of God. It is in, it is in his obedience to God, he was led in that particular place. And his, his obedience to God again, go forward. People crying to Moses. Moses crying to God. God telling him, why are you crying to me for? <laughs> that sounds like somebody doesn't care, doesn't it? But he knew exactly what he's going to do. So what was, what was needed? Trust. Trust that he didn't bring me this far to destroy me. He didn't tell me to leave now here to kill me. He didn't tell me to throw myself in the sea so that I'll drown. What is he going to do? He said, go forward. Go forward where, Lord, this sea? So are you waiting for a wind from the Lord to take you up and just cause you to swim? Those who never learned to swim, they will just begin to swim and get to the next point. No, God said, go forward. Say to the people. So Moses built up courage and said to the people, Today, the Egyptians you see, you will see no more. Wow. So God would have spoken to him. Stretch the rod across the sea. God didn't tell him that prior to that moment. God didn't tell him that he was going to encounter that along the path of his obedience to God. Sovereignty. See, God wants to, us to know this. So that when you face certain challenges, you don't think God has abandoned you or this decision you make wasn't God because now you got to the po a point where you're stuck and God is telling you to go forward and there's nowhere to go. Maybe I missed God somewhere. No, you didn't miss God anywhere. Listen to him and be not afraid. We know how that ended. That God parted the sea the children of Israel walked through on dry land, and that was not nonsense story. Today, 
archaeologists and others, scientists, has the proof because in that same place they found coral on those wheels that was, that fell off the chariot today, still buried beneath the water as a proof that that did happen and it was not a nonsense story. What is he saying? What is he saying? His sovereign act. Now that you have made the decision you've made to let go of what he tells you to let go of, now you move into the world of the sovereignty of God and a call for consistent trust as he leads you forward. So, David understood that. The psalmist understood that. And here we have in Job chapter 9 and verse 10 to 12, Job also understood that. He understood that. Job chapter 9 verse 10 to 12, he does great things too marvelous to understand. Too marvelous to understand the sovereign act of God. Too marvelous to understand. Or incomprehensible to a natural human mind. Incomprehensible. It goes on to say, he performed countless miracles. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. What? When he comes near, I can't see him. Meaning, naturally speaking, in my own mind, through my own eyes or my natural senses, I cannot perceive in myself, by myself, the movement of God, even though it is happening close in close proximity, I cannot detect it. Unless he tells me that he's in the midst moving, I can't see him. On my own, in other words, on my own, without his spirit, I have no way of knowing this. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he moves by, I do not, I do not see him go. I don't know where he goes. I can't, I can't see. It's like a blind man. In myself, by myself, I cannot perceive the movements and the work of God in the midst of me. Yet he can be working so close but yet I'm not able to see because I'm not permitted to see because I can't see on my own the sovereign act of God. And I will, only, I will only know if he tells me. I cannot enter into that knowledge unless he initiates it. Apart from that, I don't know. So it would be presumptuous of us to assume that we know what God is doing when we don't know. So you need, you need to be very careful in this environment you've entered into. Job's counselors understood that. His friends, when they begin to counsel him, thinking that what has happened to Job is something he may have done. And then God spoke to them and said, you need, you need to let Job pray for you because you're in trouble. Because you've counseled him outside of what I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. And of course, like us, again, human beings, we see something and everybody give their opinion. Everybody take a piece of the cake. Everybody has something to say. You are not God. You don't know. Unless God will visit you, you have no way of knowing. You can know how many scriptures you know in the script in the Bible. But unless God tells you, God can act sovereignly unless he tells you, you have no way of knowing. Please do not become presumptuous. Only do what he tells you. What he has not revealed to you, give him praise. But don't you ever become presumptuous. And even question God, why is he doing what he's doing? God knows why he's doing what he's doing. All he needs of us is our trust. He's perfect, can't make mistake, does everything that is right. Will never do wrong, cannot do wrong. That's a process we have to learn. As we journey with God. 
Okay. So Job said, if he pass by, if he comes near, I don't see him. I can't see him. He can be walking in your midst, but unless he reveals it to you, you have no way of knowing that it's God until he tells you. Or show you exactly what is happening. So it, it tells us again that the natural human mind or senses cannot perceive the administrative work of God without God's own initiative. Just cannot. Verse 12 of the same passage said, if he snatches someone in death, or if he takes somebody away, physically, someone dies, who can stop him? Nobody. Who can stop him? Who dares to ask? What are you doing? What are you doing, God? Who dares to ask that? So we understand what our position is. And all of these things are written for us, our understanding of the sovereignty of God. Once, once you don't know and once, once God has not revealed it to you, please do not become presumptuous and bring yourself into judgment. Trust and go with him. Because he's taking you in the right place. He can't make mistakes. Okay? Back to verse 12. If he snatches someone in death, who can stop him? Who dares to say, what are you doing? That's verse 12, chapter 9 from the New Living Translation. So our God, the sovereign God, he has the right to do whatever he pleases because everything is his and was made for him. Everything. So you keep that in your mind. As you would have made the decision that he's called upon you to make, you keep that in your mind. What do I keep in my mind? He has the right to do whatever he pleases because everything is his and was made for him. He has determined the way of disposing what he has made. So what, whichever way he chooses to dispose of it, we don't have to ask him, Lord, why? Why you dispose of it this way? Couldn't you dispose of it? No, that's not your business. So you have to mind your own business in this business of walking with God. You have to stick to your business. Mind your own business in the business of God and don't step out of that. He wants you to know that. He wants us to understand how this sovereign act of God happens and what is our part in the midst of this. How are we supposed to function? What are we supposed to do? so that we don't become bewildered. He says, Limoth, let the people know my sovereignty. Let them know that I'm sovereign. But also let them know that I have their best interest at heart and I do all things for my glory and for their good, even when they do not understand the requirement that I placed upon each one in this call that is issued to us out of our confinement to be ushered into the sovereignty of, the, of a boundless, limitless God. Now we must learn God who called us to himself on this path that we are on with him, okay? So we don't become confused or bewildered by the things he would ask us to do with him. And as the, the fellowship is strengthened along the path. I want to say this again, because I think it's necessary. He has the right to do whatever he pleases. 
because everything is his and was made for him. And he determined the way of disposing what he has made. He determines that, no one else. He determines that. And he's right. Whatever way he chooses to dispose of what is his, he's right. Because he made it, it's his. They're all his. So we would just be fast to say, but why God dispose of it this way? I mean, uh, this is strange. So why didn't, don't, why are you beating up yourself? Why are you, why are you going into those things? He is right. All is his. He determines the way in which it should be disposed. So you rest. Don't, don't, don't be bothered about his decisions on things. Just be concerned that you follow the instructions that he gives. Okay? And that you don't argue with God. That you don't argue with God. You don't argue with God. The Apostle Paul describes God's sovereign acts over his creation in this way in Romans chapter 9, verse 17 to 21. This is very interesting. And all of this is for our learning. The apostle described God's acts over his creation. Romans chapter 9, verse 17 to 21 from the, the NIV version, the NIV. For scripture says, to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose. So I raise you up. So just think of you getting a prophetic word from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, I'm raising you up for this purpose. What is the purpose? I raise you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you. Wow. And that you, and that my name might be proclaimed to all the earth. So I raise you up. Now, don't you, we, try to, we will try to interpret that in our own understanding. Well, God raised me up to display his power in me. But how was that going to happen? God had in his mind already what he meant by that. One would think that, that Pharaoh is going to be stretching out his hands and great power of God is going to flow. No. God did something the opposite. So in the scripture, God said to Pharaoh, that he had a purpose for making him king over Egypt, right? And the purpose was that he might display his power and his great name throughout the whole earth. That people will know about God. They will know how great God is. They'll know God's ability. They'll know what God can do. But this came about by God hardening the heart of Pharaoh so that he would keep the people of God in bondage and that he would not be able to let them go and that God would display his mighty power over the gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were all the idols that the people built to bow down to, that they worship. And in order for that to happen, this king's heart has to become stubborn resisting God's instructions. And God did it himself. He hardened the man's heart that he could not let the people go. Now you'd say, but why God had to do that? Why God could dis uh, display his power uh, apart from doing that? This is what he chose to do. So Paul was speaking about that. He was giving a reference to that in this passage and was talking about you can't tell God what to do if, if he wants to harden those who want to, if you make a vessel for honor, one for, 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 for dishonor, whatever he chooses is his, everything is his. So God raised up Pharaoh's king, but let's hear what the apostle Paul said further first, and then we'll go further into Pharaoh's business and his heart being hardened. So the apostle goes on to say, therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Keep in mind, everything is his, right? A sovereign act of God. So he goes on to say, verse 19, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? That seems like a good argument to make, right? Seems like. 
but it is not. So the, the apostle continues. For who is able to resist his will? So he said, one of you may say, why did he still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? In verse 20, he said, but who are you? Paul responded, but who are you? A human being to talk back to God, <laughs> to tell God what he should do. Who are you as a human being who were made to talk back to God, who is the maker? You can't tell him what to do. That's what he was saying. Okay. Who are you as a human being to talk back to God? And he goes on to say, shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this or a vessel of honor, uh, one for, for one to put stuff in, one to display? Who are you to say that? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, so man and God, you were made. God was not formed, God formed you. So what is formed, say to the one who formed it, why you make me like this? And he goes on to say, does not the potter, given an example of the potter is the one who made a clear design, the vessel, from whatever lump he chooses. This is choice, the sovereign act, whatever he chooses, not what you want, whatever he chooses, whatever he chooses. He says, does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Doesn't he have the right to do that? Of course. Think of the potter, think of the clay telling the potter what he should do with what the potter chooses to make. In other words, that's not your business. Your business is to do what he says, to follow his requirement, to follow his instruction. And many of us have got into the business of arguing with God. Why he didn't do this? So why he didn't do this? You're not God. You are likened unto what the Apostle Paul is alluding to here. You are the clay. He is a potter. He is doing the designing for what he wants. It is his decision that is right. It is his decision that is most important. This is what he wants to do. This is what he chooses to do. This is what he has designed because he chose to design it. He don't have to ask anybody's opinion. This is what he wants to do. So if he decides that he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, raise him up as king, displaying his power through him means that he would be as a king in a position. His heart will be hardened, keeping the train of Israel on the bondage, refusing to let them go. And out of his refusal, God is able to display his power in Egypt that will spread across the whole earth that people would recognize the ability and power of God. God will gain glory out of a man's heart whom he has hardened for his glory. And he made him. He put him there as king. How do you rationalize that? It is called a sovereign act of God. And this is what you need to know about God. And this is what he wants me to communicate to you tonight. The sovereignty of God. You would never find out God's decision, the reason why he has done certain things, unless he tells you. If he never tells you, you have no way of knowing. And all of the remarks that you would make would be therein is as a result of that. Same thing. So to all of us who came out in response to the Lord, as he calls us, he wants so this is what we learn from God. His sovereignty. The sovereign act of God. The way in which he does things. It's not our ways. It's his. And all he wants of us is to respond appropriately, meaning that we do exactly what he tells us. Okay, so God, harden his heart. 
But God, why do you have to do this? That's not your business. But why couldn't you do it this way? You don't tell God what to do. You're not his advisors, as many of us assume to be God's advisors. And we tell God what we think he should do. It's be really fast, don't, we, don't you think? Yeah. And many of us don't even know we are too, too fast. Or so fast. We joined the speed lane. You, 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 you probably got a Subaru or Skyliner now. <laughs> You've joined the fast lane. Too fast. Or presumptuous. And many have gotten themselves into trouble because of that. And many don't even know that the trouble that they're in now is as a result of what they have done. Spoke out of time. Being presumptuous. Because they think they have got in a box. Because they went to the Bible school and they went to all of these and they have all these theological uh, uh, things and they can tell you where to find certain scripture. <laughs> I wonder if you were there with all of the scripture references that you found and hearing Moses telling the people, uh, God said to go and make this snake and put it on a pole. I wonder what you would have said with all of the scripture that you have, that you have in your mind from the schools that you went to, you, 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 with all of your theology, your theology. He blows your theology out of the way. We don't understand the vastness of God, and that's what God has gotten many of us into a lot of trouble. All he requires of us is to follow his instruction. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. We have the written word of God and our fellowship with God. It is in that relationship and fellowship we learn him more. And at times you're called upon to do certain things. You go through the scriptures that God has called on people to do certain things. And it's amazing. You and I will say that can never be God. But who are we to say that? Unless the Lord tells us. Unless the Lord tells us. Unless the Lord tells us. So, so Paul said what he said. Um, does not the potter have the right to make out of the lump what he wants? Yes, he has the right. God has the right. So let's go on to this Pharaoh's heart being hardened business now. Now, I want you to watch this. And as I was going through this, I smiled to myself. I said, Lord, you're amazing. Because walking with God is just trusting God and following the instruction he gives. We don't always understand the things that God has asked us to do. And, and, and in it, the most times we don't even, it doesn't seem to make sense to us, really. Does it make sense that one man, the man Christ Jesus came and his way of of saving humanity is to be beaten, to be, dis to be, to be ripped into pieces like that. By that, I don't mean he, his body was torn into pieces, but he was beaten beyond recognition and went through all that he went through, hung on a cross and bled and died. And that is a means to which all mankind can be saved and be, be drawn back to God and receive life. You think, but why didn't he use another method? You're not God. That's what he chose to do. And what he chose to do, you have to see it this way. Everything that God has chosen, all the method and methodology of God must be viewed by us as the best and is right and is good. That's what he wants. That's the view he wants us to hold. Okay? So let's go into this hard and hard business with Pharaoh. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, which led to Pharaoh Pharaoh's refusal of letting the children of Israel go. And so I wanted to see this, the sovereignty of God. Exodus chapter 4, verse 21 to 23, from the new, uh, the, the NIV version. This, is, this amazes me, right? The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, See that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you, I've given you the power to do. See that you perform all the wonders before Pharaoh that I've given you the power to do. So I give you power to perform wonders before Pharaoh. So when you go, make sure that you do that. He goes on to say, but I will harden his heart. God said, he will harden Pharaoh's heart. But I will harden his heart so that 
he will not let the people go. Now, now for us, God, if you harden his heart, why are you sending me to go and tell him to let the people go? Doesn't make sense, does it? God, you said you harden in his heart so that he's not going to let the people go. And now you're telling me to go to him and tell him, let the people go. To us, in our natural mind, don't seem to make sense, does it? But it makes all the sense to God. So you see, our thinking are not the same. This is what the Lord said, as the heavens are higher than, uh, than the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways from yours. They're not the same. We don't think the same. We don't do things the same. Our decisions and methods aren't the same. So in this journey with God, into the sovereign act of God, he wants us to understand these things. Okay? He wants us to understand these things about him. And when you don't give us, when you, if he did not give you further understanding on certain things, but just tell you to do a specific thing, just do that. He made it clear to you and said, do thus and thus and thus. Don't argue, why should I do this? Explain to Lord, I'm not moving. You know my heart, I want to do it, but I'm not moving until you explain to me. Well, you're going to stay right there because God will not give you explanation. He wants your obedience because it is in your obedience you learn to trust when you are not able to explain what he has asked you to do. All you know that he said to you, just to do it. May sound crazy. But he said to do it. To others, you're crazy, but to God, you're wise. Because wisdom is in obeying what he says. It's, this is wonderful. So I'm looking at these things and listening to his voice to communicate these things to you. So, so God said those things. I hardened his heart. He would not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, and God tell him what to say. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn. I thought, but this is this song's crazy. No, it's not crazy. It's right. It's what God chose to do. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But he still told, he still tell Moses, go to him. Now, if you were to rationalize, God said to somebody, I've hardened this one heart. So what are you going for? The person is not going to respond. So you should not even go. But yet God said, go. Now, if you were to come to somebody and you're trying to get some counsel uh, because God has spoken to you to go and talk to someone, but God said to you as well that he hardened the person's heart. And think of the human mind going, trying to calculate and analyze. Uh, this don't seem to add up. Of course it can add up. <laughs> Don't seem to add up. Because the heart is hardened, but still go to them. Tell them to let the people go. But I harden his heart, so he would not let them go. But go to him still. The sovereign act of God. Don't be confused. Don't be bewildered. Just what he tells you to do, even if he said he hardened heart, and he tells you to do whatever he tells you to do, do. Moses didn't argue with God, but God... In, in this passage, he didn't say, well, God, you harden his heart, but why are you sending me? So Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. After Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, thus, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go, that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? Who is the Lord? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Those were his words. So Pharaoh refused to let the people go. He refused. Because God made his heart stubborn. One more passage on this Pharaoh thing, the sovereignty of God, okay? And this is what Paul was alluded to in Romans, the passage we just looked at. Exodus 10, verse 1 to 2, the NIV translation. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. God, go to him. You made his heart stubborn. You tell me to go to him. Then the Lord said, let's read it over. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials so that I may perform, watch this, this is the reason, so that I may perform these signs of mine among them. That you may tell your children, as Moses and Aaron, that you may tell your children and grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I perform my signs and wonders among them. And that you may know that I am the Lord. I am in charge. So I'm doing this. That a record, a memorial, not only for all the earth, which all the earth will know and see the power and greatness of God and the ability of God, what he's capable of doing, but your children and your children's children would have a memorial of God's act among the Egyptians. The power of God and all of the earth will know the greatness of God's ability. And God said, I raise up this man for this single purpose that I might harden his heart, that he keep the children of Israel in bondage and I will show my great power to all the earth. And to you, Aaron and Moses, your children and children, children. This is the purpose for which I raise them up. So the, 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 the scripture that says, to show my glory in him was not that um, uh, Pharaoh would stretch his hand and do great signs and wonders for God, but God hardened his heart. So God's understanding of showing his glory through Pharaoh would not have been our understanding as to how the glory would come. The sovereignty of God. What was Moses required to do? In his fellowship with God, he just did what God told him. Though he knew that his heart was, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, though he knew God hardened his heart, he did not quarrel with God and try to rationalize. Why would you send me then after you have done this? But he went. He went. He went. What is God telling us? Learn this about me. I'm sovereign. I do what I please. With whomever, through whomever, whenever, and wherever, whenever I want to. You cannot confine me by your way of thinking. So I move you from that. You left all the things that, was, that was confined you, confining you to come into the environment of my sovereignty and learn these things about me. All I want of you, do what I ask and don't question my decisions. That's my business. Your business is to do what I ask you to do. Sounds strong, isn't it? That's the God we serve. Now, I wanted to watch this. After the humiliating experience of King Nebuchadnezzar, the revelation he had of God was summarized in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. He had a, a humiliating experience because of his pride. And so at the end of God's dealing with him, he concluded a revelation came. He understood some things about God that he didn't know. And so he penned it. And hear what he said in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35, the New Living Translation. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him, compared to God. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the peoples of the earth. He does as he pleases. Not what anybody says. He does what he pleases. He goes on to say, no one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? 
He is sovereign and will give account to no one for what he does. No one. King Nebuchadnezzar penned those words because of what he discovered. He does what he please. You and I must know this. That God does what pleases him. In heaven, among the angels, and among the sons of men. Whatever he wants. But why should he do whatever he wants? All is his. He made it. He made it for him. No one can tell him what he should do with what he has made. It's his. We didn't make us. He made us. And everything else he has made. And he wants us to understand this. So the record is here for us to see. So we don't miss it in our walk with him. So, he is infinitely wise. This is God. He's infinitely wise and cannot make mistakes. Keep this in your mind. God is infinitely wise and he cannot make mistakes. His knowledge of people and things transcend time. Transcend time and ante anticipates events. He knows everything. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5 tells us that. He told Jeremiah, before I form you in the belly, I knew you. And this is my plan for you. Nothing can be concealed from his knowledge. And we know that. And you can look at Psalms 139 verse 1 to 16. David said, where can I go from your presence? Where can I go? Night and, the, night and day are alike to you. Nothing can be concealed from him. And you can take that passage down again. Let me give it to you again. Psalms 139, verse 1 to 16. Read all of it and hear what it says. With this knowledge, he is able to declare the end of what he began from the beginning. With this knowledge, he's able to declare the end of what he began from the beginning. So he began the beginning. He began the beginning and he ended it. And he can tell you what the end of what he began will be before it is manifested. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10. So that whenever he tells you to do something, understand that the God you and I are serving knows the end. He knows the in-between. And isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it amazing that God sometimes only shows us the end of where he's taking us and never tells us all the in-betweens. And if we're not careful, when we begin to go through the process of the in-between to get to the end of what he showed us, many people faint in the process, never get to the end because the journey to the end does not even look like the end of what he revealed. For example, Joseph, all Joseph saw is that a day will come when the, the stars, the moon, and the sun is bowing down to him. That's all he saw. The process that leads to that, he didn't see that. God didn't show him that his brothers would put him in a pit, that they would, they would sell him to, to merchants. He would be sold into Egypt. He would, he would be in prison, he would be accused. Based on the acquisition, he's going to be placed into prison. How long he would be in prison? And after certain processes, he would rise to become the king of Egypt or somebody in, in, in place of authority. The second man under the 
the ruler of, over all of Egypt. All he showed him was the end. But God knew the beginning. He knew the end. He knew the in-between. So he just showed him the end. So in all of the journey, just keep your mind on the end because that's where I want to take you so that you allow the process to take place. The sovereign act of God. All of this is God's sovereignty. And he doesn't have to tell him. He only tells us what he wants us to know. So if he decides to show you the end and not the in-between, that's all that he tells you. You can seek his face and cry how much you want to pull down heaven and knock on heaven's door. And he chooses not to say that. You have no way of knowing. And if you choose to assume, you're just being presu presumptuous. Unless he tells you his own initiative. So Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. That's God. He will do all his pleasure. Only the Lord can tell us the future before it even happened. What he chooses not to say or to reveal to us, we have no way of knowing. I said that before and said it again. For the secret things belong to God. God has secrets. But we are not accountable for the secrets that he has not revealed to us. What we are accountable for is those things that he revealed to us and our children and children, children. So Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, it says, Deuteronomy 29, 29, uh, the New King James Version, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord. The secret things belong to whom? The Lord, our God. The secret things are his, or the things he chooses not to reveal, it belong to him. It goes on to say, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do the word of his law. In other words, God's secret, and I said it before, I'll say it again, is his own that he did not reveal to us. We are not accountable for those things that we don't know that God has not revealed to us. What he has revealed to us, we are accountable for, us and our children, all that he has revealed to us, that we may obey his word, his instructions, because the revelation of what he reveals are instructions given. That's for us. What he has not revealed is not for us. So we are not accountable for that. We are accountable for what he has revealed to us. But he has secrets. And we have no way of knowing them. Only Jesus Christ knows those secrets, according to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27, and the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. So I'll give you those passages again. Jesus knows, because nobody knows the Father except Jesus. It's Matthew 11 and verse 27, and Holy Spirit knows, no one knows the mind of God, but the Spirit of God, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. As for us, we only know what he tells us. So we are not accountable for what is unknown to us, but we are, but we and our children are accountable for all that he has revealed to us. He wants us to know that. Okay? He wants us to know that. With this being said, let us not try to box God to our own way of thinking, into our own way of thinking. Let us not try to box God into our own way of thinking. This is what one of his main emphasis tonight, when he says he called us out from all the restrictions and the things that restrain us and try to hinder us and releases us into an environment of his sovereignty. With that being said, all the thing that our own mindset of God and how we think God should do certain things, Understand that is not how we think he should do certain things, but what he chooses to do, or what he chooses to do. So again, 
With that being said, with that being said, <laughs> thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So we are accountable for what is unknown to us. We, we are not accountable for what is unknown to us, but we are accountable. We and our children are accountable for what he has revealed to us. Um, now, with that being said, let us not try to box God to our own way of thinking, but rather let us allow his mind to become our mind, according to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Okay? Let this mind be in you. So we move from our former mindset of all the confinements to the mind of Christ that ushers us into the whole understanding of the sovereign act of God and what is required of us as we move forward. His call to us involves, and hear this, people, his call to us involves the destroying of our own humanistic views. The destroying of our own humanistic views and releases us into the limitlessness of God's environment of sovereignty. His boundaries must now become our habitation. Whatever his boundaries are, it must now become our habitation, the place from which we live and move and have our being because we are not confined by our views of God, we are confined by his views of himself that he initiates and makes known to us. Not people's views, not false religious, false humanistic, all of those, those concepts which has interfered with the truth of who God is. And now through our obedience, we're released into an understanding of God we've never had. He calls, it, he calls it an environment of his limitlessness or his sovereignty. And I'm almost through, closing up now, coming to the end. His boundaries must now become our habitation where we live. So let us allow, let us allow him to remove, to remove our humanistic boundaries and release us into his unlimited and boundless environment of sovereignty. Where human impossibilities become possibilities. Let us allow him let us allow him to remove our humanistic boundaries and release us into his unlimited and boundless environment of sovereignty where human impossibilities become possibilities. This is what is ushering us into. So what we've left on this journey, as others would have experienced, the sovereignty of God. I dare not question the decisions of God. He's right. I don't understand it all. I don't have to understand it all. I have to just do what he says. And I choose to do because he's right. Once you set it in your mind that God is perfect, God is right. I don't understand all his decisions. I don't understand why he did it that way. I don't understand it. I will not spend the night or days beating up myself, weeping, bombarding heaven, thrown, thrown to try to get him to give me an understanding of what he chose not to reveal because of secret things are his. And he owes it to nobody to reveal those secret things. If he chooses to, 
And we must not think that we, we have a right to know. No, we have a right to obey what he says. And follow God. And what he has not revealed to us. We have no way of knowing. No, you know, and finally, wasn't it strange that John the Baptist was among the people? Maybe he didn't even know who he was. Because when the, when, when the Pharisees and the, and the scribes sent to ask who he was, whether he was the Christ or whether he was that prophet, he said, no, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the prophet. Who, well, who are you then? Who should we tell them? Who are you? Uh, why are you doing these things? He said, well, I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice of one crying in the wilderness. As the prophet has, has said, prepare the way of the Lord. That's who I am. But after the death of John, Jesus said to the people, if you're willing to receive this, if you're willing to receive this, this was Elijah who was to come. This was the one who was prophesied. I will send Elijah before my coming. This was Elijah. And then they went, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I was baptized by him. No. But they had no way of knowing. That was kept until John's death. Jesus said, he who knew who John was, <laughs> after John was dead, he said, this was Elijah. This is the man who you said was, had a, who had a demon because he wasn't eating, he, his food was dust and dust and dust. This was Elijah. This is the one who God said would come. You just saw him. He now dead. He was in your presence. Unless he reveals it, you have no way of knowing. We don't even know who we're dealing with unless God reveals it to us. We have no idea. The people we stood before, the people we interact, we don't even know who they are. We don't know if some of these people are, are fulfillment of prophecy before our very eyes interacting with on a normal basis, and we don't even know that, they are that those, those persons are the persons the scripture will talk about. <laughs> unless God reveals it. We have no way of knowing. And so, as you and I walked with this sovereign God who acts sovereignly in any part of the universe, what he wants of us is that you trust me. You obey what I tell you. And even when you don't seem to be able to interpret my decision in my administrative acts in the earth and the display of his power in the midst of certain activities. Remember, we don't need to know everything. We just need to know what he tells us to do and follow. Whatever he chooses to make known to us, he would make known to us. So, He's mashing up your boundaries, your humanistic, your philosophy, your own theory, from wherever and from whomever you've learned what you've learned. You've dived into the sovereignty of God, the God of the universe, who made the heavens and the earth, the God Almighty. You cannot put him in a box. You cannot build a box, a box big enough to hold the one who fills the heaven and fills the earth. Where can you fit someone who fills the heaven and fills the earth? What house can you build to contain him? None. He cannot be contained in our cubicles that we built for him. How can he contain someone to fit that transcends the earth? Wider than the sea, wider than the earth, above the heavens. Could you build something? If it transcends the earth, it can't even fit on the earth. <laughs> so by faith, we walk with God. By faith, we trust his movement. We trust what he tells us. And as our relationship with him, our relations, our fellowship with him increase, we recognize his voice more and more and more, do what he has asked. And to those of you who had had a clear sound of God come out of this and you knew it was God, don't regress. 
progress with God. Don't draw back. Continue the walk. He doesn't have to explain everything to you. He just has to tell you what you need to do. And you do that, and it would lead to the path that he's taking you. He knows the end of your days in the earth. He has crafted it before you came. He has arranged it. He has. And your fellowship with him, your obedience to him will keep you into that very wonderful and glorious path that will bring a glorious end to the finishing of your days in the earth. Outside of that, you're in for chaos and confusion. And that's not what he wants. So you've heard tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, your word has gone forth. The sound is clear. The people has heard. You are sovereign and you act sovereignly in all of the universe. You've made the universe. You travel in every part of the universe. You are all over the universe. The vast expanse of the heavenly bodies, you cover them all. And even to the open space, you cover that as well. You are still creating and expanding the stars and the planets in the heavenlies. And though the billions and trillions of them that exist, you have a plan for all of them. How vast are your glorious mind, O oh God. Forgive us for trying to confine you in our little box of thinking. Thank you for blowing our fuse and usher us into your sovereign act. And thank you for the call for us to respond in obedience to your voice. We bless your name and we thank you. And we choose to ascend. We choose to rise with you. We choose to soar with you. We choose to follow you when we don't understand it. All of your decisions, we choose to follow the instruction you give to us and to follow them to the letter and not to regress. Blessed be your powerful name. You have the right to do whatever you choose to do. All the things are yours. It is all yours and it is for your glory. Father, your will be done. Your purpose is prosper. And thank you for those persons who have willingly choose to abandon all the restrictions and the things that causes them to stumble and release themselves into your powerful, glorious, and mighty hand. Blessed be your name, O oh God, as you cause us to move into all that you have destined for us in the earth. We thank you. We bless you. We receive the invitation. We receive the instruction. We receive the knowledge. We receive what you have imparted to us. And by the power of your glorious name, we rise, O oh God, with the strength, with the understanding that you do all things well, all things well, all things well. No one can steer your hand. You are God. You are the Almighty. You are the most powerful one, and all of your ways are right. Father, this day before the, this people, I make a boast, declaring that you cannot make mistakes. You have never made a mistake and you will never make mistakes. Blessed be a glorious name. We boast in your ability, your greatness, your power, your awesome glory, your rightness in the earth. You are God. The earth is yours and the fullness thereof. Thank you, Lord, for the understanding. Thank you for the understanding. And we bless your name, Lord. And those who have left, all that you've called on them to, let, to leave, we will not regress. We will continue to progress with you. Thank you for opening the eyes of our understanding to the glory of your name, Father. Thank you. Thank you, glorious one. Amen. 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 Good. Good. So we've heard, saints, the sovereign one called you. And he has given you some instructions, given us some instructions. So we now go forward, okay? And release ourselves like a bird that took flight. We open our wings under the wind of the Holy Spirit. And the sovereignty of God and the power of God and the glory of God takes us into his destiny that he has ordained for us. We soar like eagles, resting comfortably in the awesome wisdom of the one who does right always. 
the God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Blessed be the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. And I'll see you on Tuesday and maybe Thursday in the week again. Shalom.